One, two, testing, testing. Is it coming through there? Is it really? Okay. We'll get started here in about five minutes. Five minutes to departure.
Good evening. Good evening. Is that coming through okay? It doesn't sound like it. Uh, let me. She's gonna check on the, the headset. No, she doesn't. She's making a face and move this up. Oh, look, there it is. I'm a little closer now. How about that? Does that sound better? Glad you guys are here. Uh, we are uh, in Luke three today. Uh, three and four. Um, anything uh, that came up from Luke 1 or 2 before we get rolling? Anything that you thought, ah, oh, we should have talked about this last week and we didn't. Any Christmas carols? Anyone wants to sing a solo? <laughs> no? You guys, I just want to say that uh, the evening class has not been real quick to talk but in the, in the past, but this this semester, and I can only, I'm sorry, we're just speaking of semesters. You guys have been great. You've been raising your hands and saying stuff and like asking questions. I don't know the answer, but you've been asking questions. <laughs> I've repeated like half of them, so I, mean, I feel like we're doing really good uh, together, uh, making some real growth. So uh, did chapter one and two. We're in chapter three and four, uh, and then we'll be in five and six. You're catching a pattern. There is a couple weeks coming up where we'll just do one chapter. I don't think you're finding the reading if you're doing it uh, too burdensome. I don't think right. You're is okay. Uh, even if you're reading this commentary, if you read it twice, you really can get it done in a week. It's not, not too much. Uh, I'll have my NIV up here. This is my, uh, the archaeological study Bible. People were making fun of me earlier that I was trying to uh, choke a horse with my Bible. Uh, and someone said, you can't even take that on a carry-on on a plane, which is true. It won't fit in the overhead compartment. But it has all kinds of cool like articles about archaeology and other stuff that I like. So that's what this one is. Uh, obviously, I think I've said before, the best translation of the Bible is the one you'll read. So if you like King James, keep reading it if that's the one you'll read. Um, if you want to read it in German, please read it in German. Just read. Uh, that's uh, good stuff. So we're gonna, I'm going to do his translation, which is uh, N.T. Wright's. Uh, it's message-ish paraphrase. The idea is to make it sound fresh like it would to the original hearers. And obviously, you've got to make some choices when you do that. Uh, anything else? Prayer cards are not there. They're over here. There we go. So I was told to make sure I mentioned prayer cards. Those are, you can read about them, the people that we're praying for. You sign your name and the group of people, we mail those to folks when they're going through stuff. Uh, if you need prayer, let us know. Uh, there is all the documents in the back as well as books available if you need them. I think there's a basket if you want to make an investment in like the Wednesday Night Ministries food and uh, movement of the church. Um, did I do, Alyssa, did I do all the things I'm supposed to do? She's watching the live stream, so we're on the high live stream, folks. We're glad you're live and streaming. <laughs> Didn't really mean for that to come out that way. Uh, but we are glad you're live in here. Um, Luke 4. Uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for folks that are hungry uh, for food, for body, soul, mind. Uh, and so feed us in this time as we chew upon uh, your words spoken through this gospel, that it might indeed be good news again in us and then through us, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Luke 4. I'm sorry, Luke 3. You almost didn't catch that. And that would have felt really bad for y'all if y'all missed out on Luke 3. All right. Luke 3 on page 30 and right. It's chapter 3 of Luke, verse 1. If you're reading along in your Bible, let me go back. I'm still from this morning. All right. It was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip was the tetrarch of Itria, and Tractonius, Tractonitus, Licinius was tetrarch of Abilene, which is just between Midland and Lubbock. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, Annas uh, and Caiaphas were the high priests. Um, so, uh, a couple of things that Luke is doing. Luke has told you kind of the backstory of Jesus. Now he's giving that sort of political scene that Jesus enters into. You get the layers of power and control here. You have uh, Caesar, who is in Rome. Uh, and, uh, you know, Rome is one of the great empires that have ever been. I mean, uh, up until modern times, they controlled much of the known European, Northern Africa, uh, what we would call the Middle East. Um, the Egyptians thought they were new money, but they were a lot of money. You got I me? Mean, so, like, there have been empires before them, there's been those after them, but the Romans were something else, uh, quite powerful. Tiberius is the. Uh, you know, Julius Caesar is 44 BC, so the, the Republic is falling and becoming an empire right before Jesus on the scene. By the time he's in public ministry, by the sea, the empire is completely in control. There's no return to the Republic uh, in Rome. Uh, then you see Roman uh, governor, Pontius Pilate. He'll show up later. Uh, he is the, his power is derivative. He has been appointed there. 
um, to oversee a province, a colony. We might use that language. It's a conquered place that sends taxes back to Rome, uh, and Rome shares its benevolent culture uh, and other things. It's roads uh, that it builds, it's coliseums and things like that. Uh, Pontius Pilate would generally spend his time in Caesarea Maritima, that's Caesar city by the sea, um, which was very Roman, looks like an Italian coast city, uh, and not so much in Jerusalem, which is up several thousand feet in elevation, would have rained more, been a little cooler. Romans don't like it cold. Uh, they like it warm, and they like it by the water, in case they got to get, right? You know, there's a revolution we get. He would come in to Jerusalem on high holy days, uh, because that's the time when a large gathering of people would come into the city, a chance to foment uh, rebellion, which the Romans were opposed to in their provinces. Uh, so that's why, he, by the way, in a Passover, about three decades after Jesus' birth, he's around there. Uh, we also get Herod's descendants named in areas. It's like regional uh, rulers of sections of uh, the land. So not even the whole land anymore. Herod, which just like Caesar, was a name and is now a title. Um, and it is, uh, it is Herod's children that, are, that Philip that's mentioned uh, that have those different assignments. And we're also told of the high priests that have, and that's kind of similar Symbols of the religious structures who are in power. Uh, the um, the situation uh, it's a it's, these are conquered people, um, and so they have foreign control, foreign rule, and the Romans generally tried to allow the people they conquered, you know, some measure of freedom, particularly in worship, uh, but they didn't totally get like the Jews confused them. Because here's what the Romans would do. They would like sit down with the Greeks and the Macedonians and they would say, we believe in this God. And Romans like, oh yeah, 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 we do too. It's his name, it's this other name we call him. Right? Like they, don't, they, you know, they wanted to get, their whole idea about it was like, oh yeah, we're all talking about the same thing. The Jews would be like, no, all your gods are junk and there's one. And they're like, they're confused by this. And this is very uh, uncultured um, and awfully confrontational. So uh, in the eastern regions where Jews were, uh, the forcible worship of emperor was more important for a test of loyalty, which comes up with Christians in the next centuries and things like that as well, uh, when they're told, stop saying Jesus is Lord, Caesar is Lord. Uh, all right, that's the context. That's the, that's the moment. And at that time, the word of God came to John. All these places, maybe the Word of God, we think of the God showing up, should show up in the important places, in houses that are white on Pennsylvania Avenue. God should show up, hypothetically, God should show up in uh, powerful places among powerful and important people. He's already shown up among a barren woman who shouldn't be having babies but does. He's shown up uh, in the womb of a virgin girl. And now the Word of God comes to John, not to Caiaphas, the high priest, but to John. Uh, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. All right, we've been not Jerusalem, not in even uh, Shechem or other places that you might think God might show up again. God had done some stuff in the past. Nope, in the wilderness. Uh, and the wilderness, by the way, in the land, uh, you know, I'm, uh, East Texas was a wilderness to me, pine trees and rivers and, you know, uh, wild blackberries. That's wild. In Israel, it looks like, um, you know, the beginning of Star Wars where Luke's hanging out on the farm? Uh, and this morning, I, I kid you not, this woman, this woman who I think is well in her ninth decade goes, Tatooine. And I was like, we're done, let's go home. Like, uh, she's, this is amazing. Uh, she said Tatooine. Um, it is Tatooine. So it's all, it's very, uh, very dry and uh, like flint rock looking. That's what the wilderness looks like uh, on the other side um, in Judea. He went through, by the way, the Sinai region south looks much like that too. He went through the region uh, of the Jordan, that's the river, and they would speak of areas of the Jordan. If you were on the other side of the Jordan, it was the Trans Jordan, across the Jordan. Announcing a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This was written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. A voice shouting in the wilderness, get ready a path for the Lord, make the road straight for him. Every valley shall be filled in and every mountain and hill shall be flattened, the twisted paths will be straightened out, and the rough roads smoothed off, and all that lives shall see God's rescue. So John's on the scene. Uh, Isaiah's prophetic words coming through him. John sounds a lot like an Old Testament prophet. I think we talked about last week. The people started to think, 
you know, maybe God's done giving us this prophetic word. It's been a long time since they'd had somebody say, the word of the Lord for you is this, and be a fresh word to the people, um, and it'd be genuine. It'd been a long time. Uh, generations, no one in living memory had had that experience. Uh, and they started to wonder, has God done with us? And you got to think, these are people who see Roman insignia on the temple, right? Uh, I, I don't know how to create that, what that would mean to them. Uh, other than, is that my phone going off? It would be really, is that me? It could be. Uh, it's, uh, all my friends are here. I don't know, you know, uh, who are your friends are. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I should invite them in. Like, I'm in, you could totally burn, I'm in Bible study right now. What are you doing? Um, put them on speaker, we can all talk. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> this is, I don't, so there's a, it's a series, I'm not recommending it necessarily for you to watch, but it's called The Man in the High Castle, and the, the, it posits what if the Nazis had won World War II? Uh, they get the atomic bomb first, drop it on D.C., U.S. surrenders. Uh, and so you see American cities with Nazi propaganda and signs and symbols hanging. And it's, there's like a... I was going to tell you, there's a visceral kind of feeling when you see that. That's close to, like imagine coming to church and seeing, you know, red banners with a black swastika on a white field hanging over your church as you go in, because that's the only way you can have church uh, in the situation. That's what it feels like, uh, or perhaps even more so to see it in the holy places. That's the situation. And so they're wondering, maybe God's done with this people. We've been disobedient for this long. We're, we're out. <clears throat> John says, you brood of vipers. He used to say to the crowds, that's the way I love starting sermons. Who <clears throat> came out to be baptized by him, who told you to escape from God's coming anger? You'd better prove your repentance by bearing the proper fruit. And don't start saying to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Let me tell you, God can raise up children from Abraham from these stones. Sounds a little bit like Jesus on the way uh, into the city, doesn't he? Okay. Uh, the axe is already standing by the roots of the tree, so every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now that sounds super harsh, uh, but it sounds a lot like an Old Testament prophet. By the way, this is in Luke in the New Testament, so when somebody tells you, oh, the Old Testament's when God's like in and like he has a kid though and chills out and it's totally better in the New Testament, you know better now, it's the same God who is intensely for holiness and for his people and for his word and those things that corrode and destroy human life, God is intensely opposed to, uh, that lead people to destruction both temporally and eternally. God is like any parent, not going to be like, yeah, put your head in the oven. Yeah, I'm cool with that. Like, no mom responds that way when a kid reaches for a boiling pot of water uh, or is in danger. I've seen my wife jump over kitchen islands in athletic moves that no one could do uninspired by protecting their children. Uh, and there's some of that in God's nature that is worth holding on to. Um, and so John sounds a lot like that. This idea of uh, a stump or a cutting of a tree is really Old Testament talk, right? What, what more could I have done for my vine? God asks, uh, and with the prophets, to the prophets. What, I, I sheltered it. I gave it sun and water, the vine being Israel, by the way, his people. Um, but I'm going to remove my, we'll see how the vine likes it when I'm not taking care of it, is sort of what happens uh, when the vine keeps looking, Israel keeps looking at foreign powers. John sounds that way. The axe is at the root of the tree. Um, but here's the thing. Even if the tree gets cut down, here's also in the prophetic witness, up from the stump, God can do a new green thing, right? The stump of Jesse, you probably heard, which is an echo of David and a reference to messianic hopes uh, are, are common language that we see here. Um, and bearing fruit and judging, uh, evaluating, because I know judging is loaded with all kinds of things, evaluating what people are really about by the fruit of their life is over and over again in Scripture. Jesus says it, and John says it right here. You brood of vipers. All right, a word on baptism. Uh, this baptism that John is doing in the Jordan is not the same thing as Christian baptism that we will have in multiple services on Sunday. We're very excited about that. Uh, it's not the same thing. It has relationship, but it's not identical. Because the baptism we talk about is into the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And then by Luke 3, it hasn't happened yet. You know, with me? There's no life, death, and resurrection. There's life, but no death and resurrection just yet. Um, it's a ritual washing, uh, and this is John the Baptizer. Uh, my dad is a recovering Southern Baptist who thinks it's John the Southern Baptist. I know, uh, but it's a different kind of thing. That mean that he's on their team. It's just a different kind of guy. Um, he's doing this ritual washing. The most important thing to see in this is he's doing that in the Jordan River. Uh, 
There were mikvahs and ritual washing stations all around the temple and in Jerusalem. As you go into the synagogue, there'd be ritual washing and uh, cleansing. You'd have initiatory acts for converts, although uh, the idea of converting to Judaism, we think, absolutely, invite your friends, tell your neighbors. Part of that's because of what Jesus tells us to do. Converting to Judaism then, and even now to some degree, is a little different. They're going to play a little harder to get than you better be playing with your neighbors. If people want to come to church, bring them. Uh, But if you want to become Jewish in the ancient world, and really today, it's a much longer, uh, more difficult, must-prove-yourself process. Does that make sense? Um, And so uh, baptism would be a part of that initial sort of process. But also, you would go up high holies. You would be clean. Before you go to the temple, make an offering. You would uh, Part of that would be a ritual washing. It would be repeated. So Christian baptism is different because it's life, death, resurrection of Jesus. It's also one time and for all time. This ritual washing could be regular uh, and repeated. But what John is saying is those washing stations you have going up the Temple Mount in Jerusalem only make you dirtier. The powerful part about John is he's saying God wants you to get clean and can do it in the Jordan River outside of the structures of religious authority, away from the control in Jerusalem. Um, It's a statement about those power structures in Jerusalem and how those religious institutions are functioning in that world. It's not working. Uh, And John says God is making a different way. Um, Yeah, questions on that? Insights, reflections? Verse 10, page 34. What shall we do? Asked the crowds. Anyone who has two cloaks, replied John, should give one to someone who hasn't got one. The same applies to anyone who has plenty of food. Some toll collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they said, what should we do? Toll collectors, tax collectors, not popular. I know today you love taxes, but in the ancient world they were opposed. Uh, And imagine again, conquered people... Then your neighbor goes, and this is, what the, this is why the religious authorities to some degree are suspect to kind of law-observant Jews, say, well, the Romans conquer us. Let's make the best of this, um, and let's keep the peace. The Sadducees um, have kind of made a deal to make sure the temple keeps operating, and so that means maybe being under Roman control, but we'll do that. Um, and there's a lot of money in operating the temple. Uh, economics is like, let's not rock the boat. Let's just keep this thing going. They don't like rebellion talk. Uh, and so uh, the same thing here with tax collectors. Tax collector would have been your neighbor who says, yeah, we're defeated. I'll go work for the now enemy that now conquered us, and we'll collect taxes for them. That's bad enough. But most of them, it seems pretty clear, added a little surcharge. Uh, so the Romans expected them to turn in and say, you know, uh, we'll call 10 denarii, and they'll say, well, I'm going to collect 15. And that five or four or whatever goes in their pocket. You can imagine how popular they were when you saw the tax collector living well um, while you were doing everything you could to pay those taxes. Um, okay. Uh, and they're kind of saying, can we get clean in the way that you're getting people clean? Don't collect more than what is laid down, he replied, which is what you're assigned to. Some soldiers, too, asked John, what about us? What should we do? No extortion, replied John, and no blackmail. Be content with your wages. Uh, As recently in this country, as the war of independence with our good friends now in the UK, one of the issues that the colonists were mad about were soldiers showing up and saying, we're going to chill in your house for a bit. You got anything to eat? I'm going to need your horse, too. Uh, And, you know, if you happen to have a daughter, look out. You know, like that's the kind of thing that makes people really upset in lots of countries when soldiers show up and stay in their house. Same thing in the ancient world. And he's saying, uh, you know what, when you show up armed and trained, uh, don't take advantage of the people in the villages. The people were very excited. This is an exciting thing. Everyone had questioned their hearts whether John might not be the Messiah, the, one, the anointed one, the one promised. To this, John responded, I'm baptizing you with water, but somebody who is coming after me is stronger than I am. I don't deserve to untie his sandal straps. Um, The rain may have made the roads feel a little bit dirtier than normal uh, and muddy in places, but imagine the ancient world. The Romans, all roads lead to Rome. Have you heard that? That's because they built them. Uh, And we're pretty good at it. There's some pieces of that road that are still around and even some modern roads that are built on top of Roman roads because they knew what they were doing. Uh, But even still, even Roman roads would get dirty. And then you get apart from like the big cities and you're walking on dirt. These are dirt trails. Uh, And when they rain, they get muddy. So your sandals are not clean. I'm sure yours smell immaculate. Uh, But imagine them not. And then so if anybody was going to do that for you, it was a low-grade servant. 
low-grade slave, um, which, by the way, Jesus' foot washing might be in your head when it comes to this, his active service to his disciples. But here John's saying, I'm not worthy to be the servant or slave of the one who is coming, which in the end is, is true, but Jesus says, I call you friend, right? But that's grace, not because we deserve it. He's talking about what he deserves. Um, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He will have his winnowing fork and hand, bless you, to hand, ready to sort out the mess on the threshing floor and gather the corn into his barn. Any rubbish, that's British for trash. Uh, he will burn with fire and that will never go out. John urged his news, the good news on the people, with many other words. But Herod, the Tetrarch, whom John had accused in the matter of his brother's wife, Herodias, which is... Uh, you shouldn't mess with your brother's wife. That's kind of a general rule. And he did, and not good. Uh, and for all the evil things which Herod had done, um, which, by the way, Herod, just like his father, is in the business of, of trying to seem like a legitimate ruler, even though he's not. And it's this kind of fiery prophet out in the middle of nowhere telling everybody that comes to him, and your ruler over there is all kinds of wrong, can never be the rightful one. God's spirit will never dwell on him because this is who he is. Right? Yes, sir. You know, when John is going around, he's not just concerned with what people believe. He's concerned with who the people are and what the race is going to do as, as, as Jews, what the whole Judaistic race is going to do, apropos of Herod, for example. You're not a good Jewish leader. Right. Uh, he's not even a full ethnic Jew. That's a whole different conversation. Right. He's only half Jewish, yeah. Well, point that, Which is a problem. But, but, but that's where we start. Mm -hmm. I think that so often... We pawn off the idea of faith and kind of, well, live and let live and whatever, mm -hmm. without appreciating the fact that what Jesus is really after is exactly what John is after. God's creating a new race, essentially. A new way, not just of thinking, but a new way of being. And so, obviously, the religious connotations and the religious practices ain't going to translate to a racial Correct. differentiation. And I think that's what God's getting to. You know, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation, etc. So right, right. I'm reading ahead. Right? You are reading ahead. Uh, the this, this sermon in Nazareth is right down the pipe of what you're talking about. I, I think the counselor projects well, so you probably heard him. But for the live stream folks, let me repeat uh, or summarize, make sure, if, Tom, if I miss what you're saying, you're, you're showing our, our modern lens, which is absolutely right, around identity is very different than the ancient world. Identity in the ancient world is communally constructed and communally understood. Right, so a modern person might say, you know, I'm going to go for a hike through the Rockies and find myself. No ancient person would ever talk that way. Um, ever, they wouldn't even think in terms of their identity being found in themselves out there. They are who they are because who their parents were. Fully, I mean, like, that's it. That, 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 uh, in fact, it's a pretty modern notion. Now, Martin Luther, you know, the dude that nailed the announcements up on the church door? Like, these are my 95 problems with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, by the way, other people nailed things to doors all the time because, like, Facebook was not around yet. And so nailing something to a church door, that would be, like, a common place to put things. It's just that what he said was explosive. Like, uh, hey, you're an error of God's word in these places, which is big talk when you're talking to, like, a pope. They don't dig it. Um, and so in his trial, when they have the trial of Luther, and he says, these are my convictions, I stand on them, and I can do no other, right? You've probably heard these famous phrases. That is a watershed moment in all of Western culture, because it's an individual saying to the collective, I'm right, and even if I'm not, I, don't, I will not consent to the coercion of being a part of the community, which is the modern world. And in so many ways, good things came out of that. Other things came out of it too, by the way, and it's not all good. There's a lot of shadow side of that. But I think going back to what you're saying, we would be the, uh, the preferred pronoun. We say I all the time. We would be the, am I in vain of what you're talking about? And so John's concern is that we as a people have lost our way, and so we collectively must find our way, and those leaders you're following are going the wrong way. Am I in line with what you're saying? Yeah, but even deeper than that, it goes to who you are as opposed to, not necessarily as opposed to, but in addition to what you believe, i.e., is your faith going to turn you into, uh, I find my identity in Christ. That's, right. That's kind of it. And that's not just a matter of faith. That is a matter of reconstruction and, and to a certain extent, resurrection. 
So if you, if you, I think I hear you now, the faith for you then saying is like an assent to the proposition is true, right? I believe this is true being faith rather than, but it's more than that because it's this holistic redefinition of who I am as a person. If your faith does not redefine who you are, it's not worth a whole lot. Well, and it wouldn't mean much to a people who like the, the propositional facts really aren't in debate. Right? They're all agreeing on the, like if we put a creed in front of the Jews of the first century, they're going to pretty much all assent to the same statements. Are you all with me? It is, what does it mean to live in light of this that's going to be the real divider here? Um, and I think, so like modern people, right? We define, who are you? Well, uh, I'm a Longhorn. Don't boo. Uh, you know, we start. We have. I, you know, I'm a. I'm a Southern kid. I'm from Texas. We start saying cultural markers. Uh, we define ourselves by where we live, where we shop, how we eat, uh, all these different things, uh, which is a very modern way of defining identity. Again, identity in the ancient world would be uh, a completely and totally communally constructive and communally understood. Uh, so those things are like really not for debate. It's what is this group supposed to do in response to uh, what God is up to? And I, I think we agree as to the... the um, scale of that is probably larger than just saying, yes, John, your message is true. That, is that a... Sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, and the same thing with Jesus, which we flatten too. Like, like, like faith is a mere head trip. Like I just assent to the notion that Jesus, in fact, died for my sin rather than being transformed by the reality of what that might mean. Is, I think it's absolutely right. But you've definitely read ahead. Uh, that's okay. You can read all of it. It's good stuff. Um, he has added to his list of crimes that he shut up John in prison. Uh, so John's arrested, uh, his ministry comes to a close, and Jesus comes on the scene. There'd been some overlap uh, probably in this. They're obviously related cousins um, through the Mary Elizabeth connection. Um, questions on this, on uh, John the Baptist? He's an interesting guy. Yes, sir? Well, you know, to your comment that John is focusing here on what people do, um, we're talking about baptism. We're talking about him making people clean. And if you look at the two groups of people that he's talking to, specifically tax collectors and soldiers, soldiers. both of those people would be considered ritually unclean because of the things that they do regularly. And the money that has idols on it. Yeah. And, and suspect in the community. Yep. And dead bodies. Mm -hmm. So these are people who have to come back in the order to be a part of the community, to be ritually clean over and over again. And I saw this tonight, grace from John, which we don't not normally yeah. think about, which is John is not saying, stop being a tax collector, stop being a soldier. Those are realities for these folks that are just trying. Yeah, you can't go back to trade school and get a new gig, right? Like, that's not an op uh, Exactly right. Some moder We could be really judgmental about what their options might be. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, to me, the story is setting up cleanliness. Mm -hmm. And he finishes his story by saying, I can't even, I am so unclean that this one that's coming, by comparison. Right. So I hope you heard him. Yeah, go ahead. And then they're ready to hear, and this guy makes everyone clean. And the, it's a, the fire now here is another level of purification. Could you hear him okay? Uh, fantastic. It was really good insight. So what I'll say is it... Uh, the fire um, that he mentions is like uh, when you purify something with fire, it's when you wash them in water, you get most stuff. You clean something with fire, and if it survives the fire, it is clean, right? What the Apostle Paul says is a fire will come, yep. the good things will remain, yep. and the bad things will go away. So the other thing he says is clean and unclean. So watch for this in Luke. This theme you put your finger on comes up over and over again. We'll hit this many times. And so I know you've all been reading your Leviticus because it's riveting. <laughs> Uh, but this notion of clean and unclean, holy and unholy, goes way back in Israel's story. And there's a reason Leviticus made it into the story and why it was important. Not just because uh, if you ate certain meats, maybe people got sick, but it was also God defining uh, ways in which the holiness that he intends for his people might be preserved in an unholy uh, story. But what you said is absolutely right, um, that the contagion uh, was unholiness and uncleanliness. Uh, not like you know, get the Lysol out. This is a ritually unclean, meaning you don't belong in the holy places. Holy is a, means corrupted, broken, toxic, uh, destructive on the side of death, not on the side of life. Um, and so we see this, but what Luke's already suggesting, this fire of Jesus, what you'll see over and over again. So we get to the uh, situation where Jesus touched, is touched by the woman with the problem of bleeding. I mean, the law is clear on what happens there. 
Jesus is now unclean. But that's not what happens. That's not what happens. That code exists, but what happens in Jesus is it starts to get inverted. Uh, it starts to get flipped on its head. That is, now the contagion is holiness. And so she is healed rather than him being corrupted. Which is, um, while there's a consistency between Old and New Testament, maybe the biggest alteration of the experience of God is around that issue. Is the transformative power, maybe even related to what you were saying, is now let loose in the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. He'll baptize you in the Holy Spirit um, in such a way that the contagion for cleanliness will be contagious rather than the contagion of brokenness that's in the world. I think that has far-reaching implications, and Luke will bring it back. But go ahead. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. The story has to be the baptism of Jesus even before the genealogy. Chronologically, it doesn't fit. But Luke's telling us this is what, this is what the yeah. story is about. Right. And it's in a political setting, and it goes, I mean, his whole thing is this setup, right? You have the, the Mary story, and the Elizabeth story, and this John the Baptist story, because here, and then Simon and Ananias, don't forget them, because then you have a generation who's now dying, who has lived their whole life hearing it used to be different, and one day it will be again. They're that gap, you know, that people that, have, that hope for a prophetic word, and now it's shown up in the flesh. Good stuff. Yes, ma'am? This might be very basic, and I have not read ahead. <laughs> sort of building on uh, Tom's point, if this was so radical, this notion that you're washing in the river and you're, it means something different, why are people going along with it? Gosh, that's not basic. It's an awesome question. So her question is, if it's so radical and so challenging, why did anybody come to John? Because here, and this is true today. You can watch this. Because people will know something's wrong before they can even name it. In their life and in communities, we'll be like, something's off. And it's... Uh, it's sometimes a voice that comes. So think of like the civil rights movement. Like people in the South, like there were people that knew it was off and wrong, but didn't know what to do. And then suddenly so, somebody sits still while dogs are set on humans and fire hoses are let loose. We all go, no. Like, yeah, we got it. Something different has got to happen. It isn't because suddenly that they didn't know, it's that they can no longer pretend that the other ways were working. I think the awakening is, I think Israel, which by the way, you have Jesus and the whole movement here. And then 30 years after Jesus, you get a full-on revolution where the Jews say, uh, we're not doing the Roman thing in 66. Uh, that's, have you heard of the whole, like, Masada? That's during that whole revolution, they, that whole battle with Rome, and they, they hold out for a while. Um, then they all fall on their own swords, literally. And then the temple itself in Jerusalem is destroyed, which, by the way, hadn't been rebuilt since. Um, so there's this, there's this kind of feeling in the community that things are wrong, enough of which then John starts saying, and a way is being made that they're open to. Um, it's an interesting moment in their life that Jesus comes in the scene uh, in the middle of. So I would say that's, that's what it is. People, um, it happens in political campaigns. People like, uh, they get caught up in an idea, uh, not because maybe it makes sense to them, but they know whatever the past thing wasn't working. We do this when we hire football coaches, <laughs> right? So you have a football coach, he's tough, he's hard nosed, that's great, everybody loves that until the players don't listen to him and they get a player's coach. And he's really great to work, everybody loves him, and then he's soft. And so we gotta hire a hard nosed coach. I watch my, anyway, I'm, just, I'm dealing with it, all right? We're having problems in Austin. <laughs> We're in problems in Austin. It's not easy. It's not easy. That's right. We've been, we're doing it. It's okay. It's all right. Uh, uh, anyway, so uh, I think that's my answer. It's a great question, and I'm not sure I can completely answer, but that's how I would run at it uh, a little bit. Y'all want to hear me mispronounce some names? Let's do this. Um, so it happened that all the people were being baptized. Jesus, too, was baptized and was praying. The heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. There came a voice from heaven, you are my son, my dear son, I'm delighted with you. Pause before the misnaming of things. Okay, so you may have heard me before because it's one of my favorite passages because this is the Olin Mills picture of the Trinity. Uh, if you did not grow up as a child of the 70s and 80s, uh, Olin Mills is where you took your children, put them in Navy suits, even if you weren't in the Navy, took pictures every year, and then put them up the staircase so that as they went to go brush their teeth, they were reminded that they 
they were growing and to act better. I don't know. Uh, so you went to Owen Mills. Uh, it was like a photo studio because now everybody has a computer with a photography studio in their pocket, but you used to have to go someplace to get these things done. Uh, and we went to Owen Mills. I don't, I mean, I don't know why. Uh, I never met Owen, uh, <laughs> but that was part of it. My mother still has these photos. Um, it's the whole family. So the sun is in the water. The spirit descends like a dove in form of some kind that's visible to human eyes. And a voice speaks. This is the Father. Father, Son, Holy Spirit all together in a picture. Relationship and oneness. Only one God, but you get to see all the kind of relationship going on there. The other piece of this that's vital, and we'll see this as Jesus now is tested in, by the, uh, the devil here in chapter, is that before Jesus has fed the 5,000, before he walks on water, before he goes to the cross, before he does anything that we've been told other than go to the, you know, hide from his parents or be born. That's all we know at this point. The father speaks and says, this is my son with whom I'm delighted and well pleased. And here's the, here's, the, here's the key there, I think. The Father speaks this because here's the thing about humans. Um, we can spend our whole life trying to earn that declaration from God or from our own parents, and we can't. It is a fool's errand. It's exhausting, and broken hearts are littered in the effort to do enough, to be enough, to grow enough. And here's the model in this uh, divine family to say at the very beginning, before all of that striving, before any of the effort, you are beloved. You are my son, and with you I am delighted. Um, those are words, by the way, going to what Tom was saying, that can be transformative if not only we believe them, but actually receive the truth of it. Um, it sorry? That's new being. New being. There you go. That's this Pastor Greg, one of my heroes. Yeah. <laughs> new creation. And that's a new creation kind of thing. You, start, you have to start, beloved, and receive grace. You cannot earn it or we don't get it. Um, that's just one of those things I think even in Jesus' own ministry it's being done. Jesus was about 30 years old at the start of his work. He was, as people thought, this bothered people this morning, the son of Joseph. And I was just saying, it's just what people said. No one was like, Joseph wasn't like, well, he's sort of my son. Like, you don't say that at cocktail parties. Uh, they didn't have cocktail parties. But yeah, uh, the son of Joseph, from whom his answers proceeds back in the following line. All right, buckle up. <laughs> Heli, Mathet, Levi, Malachi, Janai, Joseph, Mattathias, Amos, Nahum, Esli, Nagai, Mahath, Mattathias, Simeon, Josek, Joda, Johanan, Resa, Zerubbabel, Sheltiel, Neri, Malachi, Adi, Kosum, Eladim, Ur. That's my favorite one in the whole list, by the way. <laughs> I love Ur, because it feels like you know, you're talking about, we're going to name this one. Like, this is the fifth one. We're going to name it, I don't know, Ur. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> like, what is Ur? <laughs> Joshua, Eliezer, Joram, Mathat, Levi, Simeon, Judah. We like that one. Joseph, Jonam, Elikam, Melia, Mena, Math. Matatha, Nathan, David, Jesse, those are names you probably know, Obed, Boaz, he's from a story with Ruth, Selah, Nashon, Aminadab, these are great names for cats, by the way, if you have any. <laughs> this is my second favorite one, Admin, great at details. Uh, Arni, Hezron, Perez, Judah, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, Terah, if you haven't noticed, we're going back in time, Nahor, Serug, Reu, Peleg, Eber, Shelah, Kainan, <sighs> that dude, uh, Arkap, Sad, Shem, Noah, Lamech, Methuselah, Enoch, Jared, Mahalalel, Kainan, Enosh, Seth, Adam, and God. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd say like 80% hit rate there. Um, all right, so we, we fight through That's probably the first time you've heard that read out loud. We don't do it very often in services. Our culture, going back to some of the things I think you're scratching at, and maybe you too, that we don't, we don't talk about defining who we are by our ancestry, although there's a renewed interest in some ways, like the 23andMe stuff, Ancestry.com. Uh, I think that's actually probably healthy for us culturally. The idea that you just showed up in the world and no one came before you is a weird thought. <laughs> but that's kind of the modern notion, that we're like actually self-create ourselves. Um, no, you didn't. I don't know you that well, but no, you didn't. Like, uh, it didn't work that way. There is some history and legacy. It's just that we move around so much. There's been so many different shifts culturally. We don't live within the touch of our ancestors. But like other cultures and other times, they memorize this. 
They know this by heart because who your people are is who you are. Now, theologically, all we really need is to know he's in the line of David because the prophetic witness, right? The names, whatever, I mean, that, that's theologically a big deal because it would say 2 Samuel 7, David, one day you'll have a son that will sit on your throne forever. Israel's been waiting for that dude for a long time uh, at this point. 2 Samuel 7. Yes, sir? Wasn't the very beginning of the Christmas story was kind of a nod to this since they had to go back to... Yes, Joseph is in the house. Uh, is uh, Joseph is a descendant of uh, of um, of David? Absolutely, from the house of David. Uh, yes. Questions, comments. I know you all love uh, the begetting. We don't do much of genealogies. It's in there for a reason. And then, as you mentioned, this is in an ancient sense exactly how you have to tell the story. Um, uh, that you wouldn't, you'd want to know who are their people. They uh, they respond very differently to that in different cultures. Um, all right, chapter four, temptation in the wilderness, Luke four. Jesus returned from the Jordan. That means he crossed the Jordan again, filled with the Holy Spirit or the Spirit. Uh, the Spirit took him into the wilderness for forty days. Forty is a very important biblical number. Uh, uh, 40 means completion or fullness the most. Uh, so that's why the punishment would be the 40 lashes minus 1. 40 would kill you. So they give you 39. Paul gets that, by the way, uh, twice, I think, in the, if I remember right. Um, so just that's what's going on. 40 days is a completion of time. 40 years of testing of the Israel, testing, they test God, really, but of wandering in the wilderness for God's people when they come out of Egypt. Um, by the way, being to call the Son of God, Jesus isn't the first thing in the Bible called that. Do you know who else is called the Son of God? No. Adam, in a sense, but Israel. Israel is called my child, my son. I've called my son out of Egypt. Uh... And Israel itself. And so in so many ways, Luke is already setting you up. Jesus is the Adam Adam was supposed to be and the Israel Israel was supposed to be. Fulfilling where they failed. So they go in, uh, whereas they go in the wilderness testing. And man, you know, uh, we focus on the first part. We read all the stuff getting out of Egypt. And 40 years they wandered around. It's not that far of a walk from Egypt to Israel. I mean, it just isn't. Uh, they wander around. And really, it's so, I mean, you read it, and it's like God says, go this way. And they go, all right. <laughs> That's a visual sight gag. If I went off the screen, you couldn't see it. Uh, they just go the other way. And then God gets on the side, and, well, now you got to go this way. And it's wandering around, just lost. Um, and they get to a point where they start grumbling against uh, God. Right? See, these are former slaves. They've been delivered, seen amazing things. They start saying things like, Man, Moses, why'd you take us out of Egypt? The meat there was really good. It's literally what they say, like the soup with the meat pots, man. Was, we could eat. And Moses goes and talks to God and is like, what, I need a different job. <laughs> like, he's like, send me to a different church. These people, uh, and, I, mean, not, I mean, not y'all, I would never, I would never. Um, <laughs> So Jesus is on his own kind of journey, being Israel, the son. Now he goes in the wilderness. Let's see how he does. Um, to be tested by the devil. The Spirit drives him into this encounter. We think of the Holy Spirit as this place we go like, to get a, like a, you know, a divine hug. The Spirit's always going to make us feel okay and is a comforter. All, that can be true, but look what the Spirit does here. Drives Jesus to a confrontation with the enemy in a barren place. If you are God's son, said the devil. Oh, I'm sorry. He ate nothing during that time. At the end of it, he was hungry, which sounds silly, except for that goes hard against the notion that Jesus only seemed like he was human. It is not weakness or a broken body that gets hungry when it isn't been fed. That's a working, functioning body. In fact, if you haven't eaten or had something to drink and you don't sense that, something's gone wrong in the system. Like you got too hot, uh, you think, oh, I'm not thirsty. That's one of the first signs of having like heat exhaustion. You probably are in a bad way. It's get you cooled off. Um, so part of this is to say, Jesus didn't just appear human. He really was. Got tired. That's not a sin. It's not weakness. We think of these things as limitations and weakness. These are human characteristics. He eats. Um, and so when he doesn't eat, he's hungry. So he's hungry. He's in a desolate place. Remember, he's, in, he's on Tatooine. <laughs> if you are God's son to the devil, tell the stone to become a loaf of bread. If you are who you think you are. If you are who you believe you are to be. Now, you think, well, he's Jesus. He's 40 days and not eating. He's really a human being. And you've got to, for a moment at least, allow Jesus' humanity to challenge us to think, 
There's got to be moments where he thinks, I'm not crazy, am I? <laughs> right? Now, sane people don't ask that question. I mean, I'm sorry, that's wrong. Crazy people don't actually ask if they're crazy. I don't know if you know anything about mental illness. Like, the certainty of mental illness is one of the things that's most disturbing. They are absolutely, completely and totally certain of something that isn't real. Uh, the, the, or isn't referring to a real thing. Here, uh, here we have Jesus. I think at some point you have Jesus, that's part of the challenge of the incarnation, is being divine and dealing with that as a human being. And the enemy says, are you really? And if you are, use your power in this way. It is written, replied Jesus, it takes more than bread to keep you alive. Then the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you authority over all of this, said the devil, and all the prestige that goes with it. It's been given to me, you see, and I give it to anyone I like. So there's lots of debate about what this means, by the way. The devil can lie. So whether or not actually all of this belongs to him in any way is a whole big discourse we can get into if you want to. Uh, but he offers it. It's been given to me, so it can all be yours if you will just worship me. It is written, replied Jesus, the Lord your God is the one you must worship. He's the only one you must serve. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, stood him on the pinnacle of the temple. If you are God's son, if the one you think you are, if you are who the voice said you were, he said, throw yourself down from here. It is written, he will give his angels a command about you to look after you. And they will carry you in their hands so that you won't hit your foot against the stone. It has been said, replied Jesus, you mustn't put your God to the test. When the devil had finished each temptation, he left him. And I swear to you, for probably 35 years of my life, I stopped reading right there somehow. But the next few words are really important. Until another opportunity. Right? This seems like this is the victory he's wanted, he's done the test, until another opportunity. Another challenge, another chance. And one of those might be, by the way, the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, the Mount of Olives sits overlooking the Temple Mount where Jesus would have his final confrontation with these mortal authorities. And that's on the edge of the wilderness. So this mountain, as you go east from the Mount of Olives, you head into the Judean wilderness. It's about half a mile and things start to dry up. That, for some reason, that mountain ridge stops the rain. I don't know if it's like a rain shadow. I think that's the effect. Rain comes off the coast and it rains around Jerusalem and we're at Tel Aviv, modern kind of plains. You get further east and it really doesn't. And then eventually it's like the Arabian Desert, which I don't know if you know, is pretty dry. Um, unlike my humor, which is what it can be. Uh, so it is <laughs> that's just the worst joke ever. Uh, so uh, that, that's where Jesus is. And so in some sense, this wilderness temptation is in, uh, it's got to be behind the scene when Jesus is on the Mount of Olives and he's uh, wrestling with the weight of the moment that's before him. His dis <coughs> friends and followers have been falling asleep. Peter needs a nap, you know. Uh, and he's asking them to pray. And it's like, his, my soul is like death. He's anguished unto death. There's blood coming out of his forehead. He's praying so hard. Uh, he's there with all those olives, which, by the way, is a place where they press the olives down. The pressure of that is not to be lost, that imagery. And I think what we're supposed to not miss, too, is right there on that hill, right overlooking where he would have his confrontation and his cross, all he has to do is turn and go east. All he has to do is go the other way. And no one ever finds him. No one finds you in the wilderness. That's why you go to the wilderness. He's gone. So Jesus is on that line again, and who knows if that isn't the opportune temptation to say, just walk away. They don't, you know, if we go to Job, I mean, Hasatan there in Job, his taunt is, they don't really love you anyway. That's the taunt, you know, that's the taunt of the enemy to the throne of grace. They don't, they love the stuff they get from you, which, by the way, Luke is going to show you. People, crowds start showing. When you're healing people, oh, the crowds will show up. When you're saying stuff people like hearing, oh my goodness, they love coming. When you start saying stuff they don't like, they start talking about throwing you off a cliff, which we're about to read. Yeah, you want to jump in on that? Well, no, this goes to your point of yeah. humanity and the full humanity of Jesus. Yep. We always think, oh, Jesus was tempted three times. No, Paul tells us he was tempted in every way that we can yeah. so that we can have a sympathetic high priest. It's not three times, it's not four times, it's all the time. It's ongoing. That's exactly right. Not sin to be tempted, not sin to be hungry, not sin to be tired, not sin to be angry. Don't sin in your anger. By the way, that goes for both genders in this room. <laughs> right? I mean this. I mean, what culture, let's be honest. Men are allowed to be angry and into stuff. Keep it churchy. <laughs> Those are two emotions we're allowed to have, and women are allowed to have every other ones but those two. 
because we have certain names for women that are those two, don't we? All that's bunk when it comes to the gospel, by the way. Those emotions and those drives are all human things that can be redeemed. Can they be twisted and brought to evil? Absolutely. But all the evil things we have known are twisted goods. The devil has made nothing. Nothing. Creates nothing. Corrupts. Doesn't create. God creates. Good makes. Evil corrupts and twists. Every evil thing we know is a good thing that should have been. Every evil thing we know is a good thing that should have been. Uh, it's a missed good, a corrupted good. Uh, it is chosen death rather than life. And I mean, evil is ferocious and real. I don't, don't hear me minimizing. I'm just saying it is a corruption of God's design and intent. Uh, and there's a lot of it. All right. Uh, and the temptation is ever to be on that side. Um, Another opportunity. I just, that line is the most powerful thing. Now, this morning, uh, we had a gentleman who thought the order of temptations was all wrong, and I said, you, would do, you could have a devil consulting business uh, on that. Um, and really, that's, uh, if you're interested in the screw tape later, C.S. Lewis is sort of that idea, like how do you coach up a devil to be good at this, um, which everybody loves that book. Lewis hated it because he didn't like thinking like the enemy, which is what you have to do when you think about how that's working. Um, and yeah, I think you're right. This is an ongoing, this is a, uh, Jesus is going public, and this is the enemy, which by the way, demons keep showing up. They seem to understand what's at stake here before people do uh, in this confrontation between what is good, life-giving, creational, uh, rather than corruption and everything else. Uh, and, uh, but it doesn't stop here. It certainly continues. It's just that um, Jesus continues to be victorious. Um, 14. Jesus returned to the Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Word about him went around through the whole district. He taught in their synagogues and gained a great reputation all around. He came to Nazareth. Remember Nazareth talked about last week? Tucked away, little town. It's where Mary grows up. It's where Jesus grows up. It's a place you go to be a law-observant Jew away from these Roman, Hellenistic, Greek influences. Tiny, tiny place. On the Sabbath, as was his regular practice, he went to the synagogue, stood up to read. You stand up to read the scripture. You sit down to teach. It's a little different than what we do, but... Uh, that's the way it went. They gave him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll, found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to tell the poor good, the good news. It's so hard to read his translation when you memorize these passages. Uh, he has sent me to announce the release to the prisoners and sight to the blind, to set the wounded victims free, to announce the year of God's special favor. This references the concept of jubilee, which would be the canceling of debts in uh, Jewish society. God said, after a certain amount of time, debts need to be canceled and a reset so there'd be no abject and destitute poor. This was a uh, mechanism within Jewish culture. My Bible's falling apart. That would... Um, uh, that means by doing that, um, which you can imagine was really popular with people that owed money and not as popular with people who were owed money. Um, and so Jesus reads this and says, this is what's going to happen. The oppressed are going to go free. The poor are going to hear the good news. Uh, and we're going to uh, cancel debts and not just financial. He rolled up the scroll, gave it to the attendant, sat down, and all eyes of the synagogue are fixed on him. Today, he began, this scripture is fulfilled in your own hearing. Everyone remarked at him. They were astonished at the words coming out of his mouth. Words of sheer grace. Isn't this Joseph's son, they said. This is our guy. Hometown hero. They love it. Don't, the crowd hasn't turned yet. It's really important not to get to the, the crowd turns on him, but there's a really clear reason, which actually goes to some of the things y'all have been saying already tonight as to why. They are amped. Anybody from a small town? If anybody from a small town ever does anything really good, they're still talking about it. They're, they're, whenever you're a small town, they're like, you should see her teach yoga. I mean, have you tasted Pat's enchiladas? They're telling that story in some feed store right now. I mean, if you, do, if you leave a small town and you, do, and you do anything bad, by the way, they're telling that story too. But if you do anything really good, I mean, they're gonna they put up a sign, right? Home of whoever. And then sometimes later they take it down if you're from Kerrville. That's a whole different story. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, they get real excited, right, when you're like from a place. That's a big deal. They are, this is huge news in town. He's brilliant. He's great. This is great. Isn't this Joseph's boy? I know what you're going to say, Jesus said. You're going to tell, uh, tell the old riddle, heal yourself, doctor. We heard of great happenings in Capernaum. Do them here in your own country. That is, do for us what we've heard you've been doing on the road show. Capernaum, by the way, is on the Sea of Galilee, famous for its fish, really important place. Uh, it is on the international highway. So 
you, I, you know, never really thought about it. Why is Israel unique? It's the land of milk and honey, which is uh, how life happens in Israel. Uh, but Israel doesn't have anything like the Nile River that makes Egypt civilization stable for thousands of years. It really doesn't have a whole lot of natural resources. They just found oil not too long ago off the coast. So that changed. But by the way, first century, not too concerned with petroleum. Um, it didn't have any of those things. It wasn't really rich in some of these things. It didn't have a lot of wood. That's why the cedar comes from Lebanon. Uh, they didn't have huge forests. What they had was, if you wanted to get from North Africa to Asia, you wanted to get from Asia to Europe or Europe to Africa, until about 100 years ago, and powered man flight started to happen, and radar came to ocean liners and things like that, to move any amount of goods and people, there was a sliver of land you had to travel through to make that journey. That's Israel. It's that piece of property. And the highway that the traders would go, which by the way is the social media of the day, traders and soldiers are how you heard news. Traveling for fun is a modern notion, right? Because you're very unlikely to die. <laughs> which is nice when you go on a trip, right? Uh, if it isn't your livelihood or isn't somebody saying, go and take that hill or I'll stab you, um, you stay home. It's better there. There's a bed, food, and people you know. Other than that, everybody could kill you. That's the ancient world. That makes you feel better about where you're, like, your drive home tonight. Uh, and so when news traveled, it went along trade routes, massively important. Controlling trade routes means you can tax the trade routes, which is how you have money in the ancient world. Which people, that's why Egypt's interested in Israel. That's why Assyria keeps showing up and Babylon. Not just to be characters in the biblical story, because there's money to be had in controlling that road. By the way, it gets so narrow, and it turns to the right when it gets to the Carmel, uh, Mount Carmel. It turns to the right, which is east when you're headed north, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, my wife has broken me of saying north and south. I'll say north, she went right or left, like which way are you facing? But uh, <laughs> some of you have had your own relational conversations. Oh, it's funny when it's my marriage. Super. All right, whatever. Uh, so Carmel, the Mount Carmel, so you turn right and you go, it goes right by the Galilee, right through Capernaum. Nazareth is back off a ridge, uh, not on the highway. You go to the ridge, you could overlook where the highway would travel. So Jesus, as a kid, go to the ridge and watch the caravans go by. Mary, too. But they didn't go by, they don't go through Nazareth, they go through Capernaum. So anything that happens in Capernaum, the whole world is going to hear about. It's uh, as close to a uh, Facebook blast or an email post, whatever you're going to do, that you can do in the ancient world. Um, they've already heard about it in Nazareth. Let me tell you the truth he went on. Prophets never get accepted in their own country. This is the truth. There were plenty of widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when heaven was shut up for three years and six months. As it wouldn't rain is what he means by heaven was shut up. Not that heaven couldn't talk. And there was a great famine over all the land. Elijah was sent to none of them, only to a widow in the Sidian town of Zarephath. And there were plenty of lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. None of them were healed, only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, everyone in the synagogue flew into the rage. God has done powerful things. Here is this powerful teacher. God is on the move. And Jesus says, here are these stories of what's going to happen. Your enemies are going to be blessed. This isn't just for you. You want it just in your town, and you want me because I'm from this town. But what I'm doing is for everybody. It fulfills that great promise in Genesis 12. Abraham, through you and your descendants, all of the earth will be blessed. So they got up and threw him out of town. They took him to the top of the mountain on which the town was built, meaning to fling him off. But he slipped through the middle of them and went away. So the cliff that is uh, probably where they took Jesus to take him off is where you could overlook the International Highway, one of my favorite spots on the entire planet because it's got pine needles and the idea that Jesus and Mary played on pine needles means a lot to an East Texas kid. Um, and uh, so you can stand there. And so we're staying there and the instructor, the first time I was there, is pointing back to the Church of the Annunciation, which I think is the name of that church, which is on the site of ancient uh, Nazareth. It's surrounded by modern Nazareth, but that's the size of the small town. In fact, it's just about the size of the, the church area. And said, uh, we're not going to do it right now, but the amount of steps from the synagogue to the, uh, up the, to the top of that hill are exhaust the limit of travel you're allowed to travel on the Sabbath. So one of the ways Jesus may have gotten away here is that these really law-observant, really intense followers, zealotry of the law, had exhausted how far they could go on the Sabbath, and Jesus decided he'd take a few more steps and kept walking. 
<laughs> they couldn't get far enough to throw him over the cliff with their Sabbath, because the rabbi would be counting. They would be counting. This is how far we can go. We can't go any further on the Sabbath. There's only far so far we can go. Couldn't throw him off the cliff. I just, I love that idea. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's great. Uh, that their own fundamentalism had trapped him in such a way they couldn't even uh, execute somebody properly. Um, that's the point, isn't it? They were so trapped by their notion of the only way God could work that the fact that what was, could happen for them was going to be shared with other people offended them so that they didn't want it anymore. Well, if they're going to get it, I don't want it. If you're going to include them, I don't want to go. If they're going to be in heaven, it's not for me. It's a bad attitude, by the way. Uh, <laughs> questions, comments? Is it, go ahead. Was it the Mount of Olives that Sabbath days walk from the temple? Very similar, very similar. You can only go so far. You're supposed to hang out around the, your worship area. I don't know if I, uh, I'm trying to think of the distance. It'd be a similar distance. You can walk. Mount of Olives feels closer, but it's also a taller hill. So it's hard for me. I'm going in October. I'll, I'll count it off for you. I'll, I'll walk it. Yeah, there'll be marks. Yeah, I mean, well, because there are, this is still a thing, right? If you're an ultra Orthodox observant Jew in Israel, there's still limits to what you would. If you drive your car in certain parts, they'll throw rocks at you because you are Sabbath breaking. Don't turn around. Don't go bowling. No, you don't go bowling. See? <laughs> There's no bowling. Now, this is not all Jews in Israel, but like Hasiatic, you do that term, or ultra Orthodox, they, they are for real. And here, hear this. So they have messianic hopes. And the, the effort is to raise righteousness in the land high enough that Messiah would come. You hear it? Right, other than where we start, can't get it there is kind of our position. Uh, God shows up in grace. So that's just, it's an interesting notion, different understandings of how God interacts with the world. Uh, Jesus went down to Capernaum, a town of Galilee. He used to teach them every Sabbath. They were astonished at his teaching because his message was powerful and authoritative. That is, um, just like law in this country, uh, and still is in many, like uh, rabbinic teaching is based on precedent. So like Rabbi such and such said, and Rabbi such and such said, Jesus just sort of said it, and that's unique. His authoritative teaching wasn't referring to somebody else's teaching. He would just say it, and they'd be like, you're young. I'm sympathetic to Jesus on this. Um, <laughs> and uh, why you talk that way, whether he's 12 or 30 in this. Um, there was a man in the synagogue with the spirit of an unclean demon, which I think is a funny adjective, like there's like super clean spick and span demons. Uh, hey you, he yelled at the top of his voice, what's going on with you and me, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're God's holy one. And I'm going to read verse 35, but we're not supposed to say this in our house. Uh, Shut up, Jesus rebuked him. Come out of him. And the demon threw the man down right there in front of them and came out without harming him. Fear came over them all. <laughs> What's all this? They started to say to one another. He's got power. He's got authority. He tells unclean spirits what to do, and they do it. Word about him went out in the whole surrounding region. He left the synagogue and went into Simon's house. This is Simon Peter, by the way. Simon's mother-in-law was sick with a high fever, and they asked him about her. He stood in front of her, rebuked the fever, and it left her. And straight away, very British, she got up and waited on them. This is one of my favorite passages. <laughs> this is as close to fraternity house Jesus you're ever going to get in the whole of the gospel, which is, gosh, man, we've been teaching all that. I could sure use a snack. Where's Peter's mom? Oh, she's sick, got a fever. Bring her here. <laughs> <laughs> Heals her, and he's like, this is just waiting on him. She's like, y'all need some Cheez-Its? We'll make some Totino's pizza rolls? Let's do this. Uh, he left the synagogue and went to Simon's house. Okay, when the sun went down, Sabbath's over, everyone who had sick people, all kinds of sickness, brought them to him. Right? The Sabbath is over now. Sun's gone down. He laid his hand. We think of days as when the sun goes up. It's opposite in, uh, or inverted in Hebrew, uh, in Jerusalem. He laid his hands on each one of them and healed and turned them. Demons came out of many people shouting, You are the Son of God. He sternly forbade them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. When the day dawned, he left town and went off to a deserted place. Jesus keeps doing this, by the way. The crowds hunted for him 
And when they caught up with him, they begged him not to leave them. I must tell the good news of God's kingdom to the other towns. That's what I was sent for. And he was announcing the message to the synagogues of Judea. Uh, a couple things about this. I know we're out of time. Uh, next week we get to go fishing, which I like, um, in chapter 5. Two important things with the end of chapter 4. Jesus moves around, but it's in a pretty small space, what they call the Evangelical Triangle. He spends most of his ministry in the northwest corner of the Galilee. Uh, you'll hear the Galilee called lots of different things. It's the same body of water. Um, and so he's there. He moves around a little bit for a number of reasons. One, lots of towns to tell, and we're kind of populating this message. They're all along the trade route there. And two, you can only imagine when people start coming from all over the place to these really small towns that it's a burden on a small community. I mean, imagine for a moment that Thanksgiving at your house lasted six months. Yeah, that's right. You love your family, but in doses. Um, so, not mine. If we were watching online, you can come and stay as long as you want. Um, so, that's, that's, but think of a whole town. There's no, you don't have like, we can, we'll put them up at the Holiday Inn. Not an option. Right? They're staying with you. And so I think Jesus moving around is in some sense graciousness to those towns, as well as there's this tension with what people are coming to get and all that Jesus wants to give them. Right? Everybody wants to come and get healed. Everybody loves the news of good news. When Jesus starts to talk about suffering and the cost and what it would mean to really follow where he's going, people go, maybe I'm good. Maybe I'm good. They don't totally understand. And this messianic secret, it's called, that the demons know and others hint at, but Jesus keeps saying, don't say, is because, again, in some ways, the full story can't be known to the other side of the cross. Even the disciples don't get it until Jesus has been in that garden, said yes to the cup that he's going to drink, and goes to the cross on our behalf. Questions, comments uh, before we take off tonight? Great question. 25 Jesus points. You get 25, Tom, 25 for you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> we'll all go home and deal with that. Uh, <laughs> think you're right. There's a real challenge. If you didn't hear, uh, she said that there's lessons for the church that can we can sit there and judge these synagogues for understanding Jesus, but the church can function just like these communities and say, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second, not them, not those people. They don't get the grace that right. That's absolutely a thing. Well, and it goes deep to community. And maybe this is what you're saying, Tom. Um, I was talking to a, a friend um, who's serving a different church, and they're going through a hard time. And his comment to me was, I wish they were as loyal to their church as they are to their college football team. <laughs> you can take that home with you if you want to deal with it for a while. But think like your, your team, they have scandals. Think about what they do. They, lo they lose the teams they shouldn't lose to. Uh, <laughs> they let you down, they do whatever, but you won't quit them, right? right? But move a service 30 minutes or change the style of music and people are like, I don't know. <laughs> and you go back to the identity being, this isn't about my preferences, but my people. And it changes it. And I'm not, I'm not telling you you have to like everything your church does. You can disagree. But if it's easy to quit it, if it's easy to walk away from it, it should feel like, you know, a divorce because these are your people, which I, you know, it can't, you can get to that. That's the best of all the bad options. It can be the best option. I'm not saying you can never leave. I'm just saying it should feel like that. And people I know that have left sometimes when it's been that hard. That's what it felt like. It felt like a death. Um, and so one of the things,